Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr., and I am pleased to be joined today by Reverend Mark Elsden. Hey. Hi there. Hey, thanks for being here. I want to read you Mark's bio. He lives and works at the intersection of money and meaning as an entrepreneur, pastor, consultant, and speaker. He's the co-founder of Rooted Good, which seeks to create more good in the world through social innovation. He's the executive director at Press House on the University of Wisconsin's Madison campus and owner of Elsden Strategic Consulting. He's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA and lives in Madison, Wisconsin with his spouse and two daughters. He's an avid cyclist and considers it a good year when he rides more miles on his bike than he drives on his car. And... uh, We'll be talking about his book here shortly. He's actually donating, hung, oh, can't talk today, 100% of the proceeds, author proceeds from the sale of the book to nonprofit organizations, uh, which is pretty cool. So uh, for our listeners, I'm getting over a head cold, so uh, going to struggle extra <laughs> more than usual with words and, <laughs> and pronunciation today. But Mark, thanks for being here. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? I think you covered it well. I guess you can uh, know that it's uh, below zero here in Madison, so um, not able to ride a ho- outside a whole lot right now, doing a bit of skiing and uh, riding my bike indoors. Um, but glad to be here and glad to talk about uh, talk about some of these important subjects. Well, the important subject I was going to ask about was how much you were riding your bike in the cold. Uh, here in the Denver metro area, it's seven degrees today, high of seven and uh, I wondered how much, you know, even as an avid cycler, you go out. Because I'm, I don't know what what the word is for like a aspiring cyclist, I guess you might say. And about 40 degrees, 45 is about all I can handle. They do say that it's really all about the clothing. And if you have the right clothing, you can do just about anything. And I, to some extent, that's true. Although I will say below zero is sort of my limit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it just gets pretty hard to stay warm, no matter what you're wearing, especially when you're moving. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I used to run a lot, and runners they used to say, you know, dress like, dress what? Let me see, dress as if it's twenty degrees warmer than it is. So if it's like forty, dress like as if it's sixty. Uh, for me, it's like I never, I hate being cold, so I would. Even when I was running, I would dress warm. And when I'm biking, when I was biking, uh, when it was less cold out, I'd I'd still overdress because I do not like being cold. <laughs> but um, yep. well, this is not a bike. This is not a biking podcast, so we'll move on. But uh, talk about uh, what it's your journey of faith, what it's meant to be a Christian in the past, and and what it looks like today. If anything's changed, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I I grew up in a in a Christian uh, home, going to going to church um, since I was since I was born, baptized um, in a Lutheran church, and uh, have had a journey of various denominations uh, throughout the throughout the years. I think broadly that that question of sort of what is <clears throat> what is faith mm-hmm. mean today, and has it changed? You know, there's that's a huge question. You could uh, you could you could study for your lifetime, but yeah, the reflection I would have, one of the reflections I would have is that I, I think at least in American Christianity for a long time, the Christian faith was associated with, with what you believe in your head, what you think about mm-hmm. something. And to me that one of the shifts that is happening and it may actually be more of a return to the ancient than it is something new is a move towards living the Christian life rather than yeah. believing a Christian idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, uh, all throughout my book, it's all throughout sort of my ministry. It's all, it's throughout my own life, my own practice. Um, 
but this idea that we uh, that we experience God through how we live and and through our uh, through the things that we do as much as we do through what we say we believe or what we think in our head. Um, and I think for me, even as the older I've gotten, the more that has proven to be the case. Yeah, awesome. Talk about a spiritual practice you've uh, you've been meaningful to you, or you might recommend to others. Well, we started the podcast with one. That's riding my bike. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but I, I will say, actually, uh, you know, this year, this COVID year that we've been in, there's been two things that, that come to my mind. One is that idea of taking care of yourself. Yeah. Um, and for me, that is very much a, a, a physical thing, uh, exercise, um, being out on my bike, um, having time to decompress, uh, making, making a commitment to that every day, regardless of how busy the day is. Um, in the dead of winter here, I've, I've, I've taken to going out on my skis, cross-country skiing for an hour or so in the middle of the day while there's still some cool. light. Yeah. Um, which is good, yeah. Um, and just just making sure that is part of the the everyday routine and, and to I experience God in, in the deepest ways out out on my on my rides and out in nature and just out moving physically moving the other practice that I think was interesting for me this year in particular was um, being led by by African American leaders in our community in response mm. to the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. uh, showing up with my family at Black Lives Matter protests and uh, prayerful protests that were really powerful here in Madison and happened all over the country. Um, and again, that's sort of an example of that living it out, sort of being letting yeah. letting the the faith be experienced in the middle of what we do and showing up, um, not just thinking about it, uh, not just talking about justice, but actually. Uh, being present in it, and in particular with this issue, um, as a as a white man being being mm -hmm. um, being led and, and let, letting myself be led by by others that know much more um, and have much more to teach me, and so that's yeah. been a particularly meaningful experience this year. Yeah, that's great. It's interesting how um, you're kind of on this theme of living out or getting away from a head. I don't know a, a head. I can't think and talk today, but. Um, yeah, faith that's all in your head and more of a lived out faith. Um, cause I mean, that's essentially what you're saying too, with your spiritual practices. It's like, it's an, it's a lived out faith rather than just like the traditional, like, you know, I'm just going to sit and read my Bible and, <laughs> and study the scriptures. I'm going to find other ways to live right. out or embody my spirituality. Right. I mean, I'm a Presbyterian minister. We love reading things. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. It's just I think that for me at least, and I think for many people, um, if it doesn't connect with what's happening in our world and what's happening around us, then it's sort of like, what's the point? Um, and and when I read, when I do read the Bible, I, I read a, a, of a of a God that entered the world, entered the entered mm -hmm. the the world, uh, the the fullness of that world. Um, uh, and so, um, to me, that's just a, a big place where that where that's experienced and where that's found. I also just want to point out uh, Mark's emphasis on uh, taking care of himself. I've been kind of like gotten that lesson recently from my spiritual director, um, and trying to. Oh, here's uh, I was going to tell our listeners we have special guests today. Hey, ask your sister. We'll have special guests today in and out of the podcast. So, folks, if you could uh, be understanding of that. Um, yeah, I was reading actually in a business book, Mark, mm -hmm. uh, about the importance of Sabbath. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important. Yeah. Uh, Mark is the author of We Aren't Broke, Uncovering Hidden Resources for Mission and Ministry. And as we we're recording, this is February. The book is coming out in June. Is that correct? Correct, June 1st. Okay, so not positive when this will air, but I think it'll be right around either before, uh, a little before that or shortly right around that time. Uh, but talk to us about what prompted the book. And I think, I'm, I'm guessing, part of the story of Press House fits in there. So tell us a little bit about that too. 
Yeah, so one of my roles for the past uh, almost 17 years has been uh, as a pastor and executive director at Press House, the Presbyterian Affiliated Campus Ministry Center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, my wife and I were called there um, in 2004 to revitalize the campus ministry. There were zero students, um, uh, a, a building falling apart around us, and uh, a, a, just a struggling situation. But we had a lot of promise and potential and history. And um, one of the things that happened uh, f in the first few years is that we um, designed and built a student apartment community um, that housed about 250 students uh, on our parking lot um, next to a historic church. Um, and, and I talk about this in the book, and th there's a great deal about that, that story um, that can be unpacked. But what, what led to this book in part was that uh, we built that project in 2006 and seven, just before the financial crisis of 2008. Mm -hmm. We were able to uh, to borrow um, financing uh, funds to uh, to build this project, a 17 million dollar uh, project. Um, and five years later, when we went to refinance, uh, which is typical in commercial um, real estate mm -hmm. like this. We uh, found ourselves in a very different um, financing environment than we had been in 2007 after the crisis yeah. of 2008. So, uh, so what that meant was that, um, like many people around the country, on paper we were sort of underwater. You might say um, uh, mm -hmm. we no problem actually filling the building at that point, no problem paying our bills, but the value of of apartment real estate had dropped uh, simply on paper. Yeah. So we were short uh, about two and a half million dollars um, in, in, the, in financing dollars, basically. And I uh, had a lot of sleepless nights trying to figure out what the heck we were going to do to keep this thing, to keep this thing open. Again, it was working just fine. Um, the, the, the debt service was fine. All, all of the, the financial elements of it were fine. Um, at mm -hmm. least at that time, uh, but we just simply needed more cash in the deal or more lending from some other partner besides yeah. besides the one we started with. So what that meant was we went and um, eventually I uh, worked with our synod, uh, the Synod of Lakes and Prairies, um, the upper Midwest region of the United States, Presbyterian Synod. Uh, took about a year of working with them to develop a partnership whereby they um, took a quarter of their endowed um, assets, their invested assets, out of traditional stock and bond investments um, wow. and actually m diversified uh, from that, those investments into real estate, Presbyterian real estate, um, real mm -hmm. estate at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, essentially our project. So they took two and a half of a roughly $10 million um, fund and uh and mm -hmm. placed it with us uh, uh in a in the form of a loan in the end and we pay a return on that money so we pay the synod back um mm -hmm. a financial return which they then use to uh, do their programming um, yeah so it's a win-win-win for everyone we get access to capital we were able to secure the rest of our financing as a result of that capital um We've served thousands of students because of that. Uh, we, we generate more than $2 million a year in revenue through our project. And then they actually take the proceeds that we're paying and use it for their ministry and programming, um, yeah. which is a fan, just an incredible model. And so, you know, a couple of years after we did that, I started to ask myself, why are we not doing this all over the place? Yeah. We've got literally billions of dollars of invested assets and property the Presbyterian Church alone, but never mind all of the denominations, yep. um, we could be moving some of that money into play uh, and into social enterprises and into mission-oriented uh, ministry projects more directly. Why am I borrowing? Why are we borrowing from banks when we have all that money even within our own family, so to speak, the own the yeah. faith family? And so that led me uh, to, to do an MBA and to then move into exploring impact investing um, and ultimately led uh, to the writing of this book. Awesome. Uh, it's, it's, I, I've, I met Mark after I started, but I was really, I started an MBA. It's been about a year now, a year ago. Uh, 
mark i think of like today i'll be like unofficially halfway through <laughs> nice <laughs> which well is done. fun yeah that is uh but it was it was fun just to come across mark as someone a pastor who's also gone or in, in your case finished an mba uh so i really enjoyed kind of getting to know mark uh certainly reading his book now as i read the book mark kind of the one of the broader themes in the book was this idea that there's this there's this we don't think of it like this in, in mainline circles, mainline Protestant circles, but your kind of broader point is that there really are like piles of cash. Maybe that's too broad, but it seems like your your point is that there's there's lots of assets in churches that we're missing. So like what's your first suggestion step for churches to begin to kind of uncover uh, or stop missing these resources? Yeah. I mean, I think there's two things, a couple, at least two things happening that, that, that lead to that. So there are, just as a point of reference in the um, consortium of uh, religious organizations that are a part of the um, a, a consortium of, of investor advocates, there's $400 billion of assets under management owned uh, by religious organizations around the world. Um, wow. If you and that's Christian, mostly Christian. If you actually expand it beyond that, it's multiple trillions of dollars. If you include wow. other faiths, um, so there's there's huge sums of money owned and invested by um, by religious entities, and it's almost mm -hmm. all invested very traditionally, um, mm -hmm. uh, placed in, in traditional investments where earnings are then taken out. So you know, invested in Facebook, Google, Amazon. Apple, um, also other, you know, all sorts of things, uh, companies basically. And, and then the, the earnings are then taken to do, to do mission and ministry, hopefully. But, uh, but there is a way in which that money could be put to use differently. I think what's holding us back sometimes, um, is, is two things. One, uh, it's, it's a, a narrow understanding of what invested assets and property can be used for. Um, mm. And so we sort of buy in automatically to this idea that the point of investing is to, to generate the highest uh, financial return at the lowest risk possible um, yeah. and to just make as much money on our invested assets as we can, period. That's kind of, that's sort of the investing mantra, um, yep. which I guess I would say why, uh, why is God's money <laughs> that we have sort of on loan to us uh, to use in this time why is that the purpose? How how is it? Is the, how is that the highest and best use of that money, um, necessarily? Um, uh, mm -hmm. if, if we're trying to do something greater with with our money than simply just make money. Um, similarly, with churches, we sort of have this very traditional understanding that churches for uh, an hour long Sunday morning service and associated programs. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a lot of other things church buildings can be used for that are ministry. The other thing that I think we is happening is, is fear. Um, there's a great yeah. deal of fear uh, about doing things differently, um, doing social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, or investing differently can be in some ways riskier. Um, it can require different level of innovation and creativity. Um, and, and it's easier and it feels safer to just sock it away, to just, uh, you yeah. know, to, to put it in, like, like the rich fool, I, I speak, of, I write about this in the book, the, the parable yeah. of the rich fool that loves to just accumulate um, the extra grain that he came across, uh, that the land produced for him, um, so he can save it for some other future day. And we sort of operate that way in the church. The interesting thing is there isn't going to be a future day if we keep operating that way, I think, in many <laughs> parts of the church. Um so we're saving it for yeah. what? I don't know, actually. I don't really know what we're saving it for, um, other than its own sake sometimes. And so, but yeah. fear, fear is a big driver of that. And I get that. I mean, I think it's just even in our own lives, um, it, personally, we're managing money, there's a lot of fear. There's a fear there's never not going to be enough. There's a fear of mm -hmm. what, you know, um, might there not be enough? And I mean, in some cases, that fear is somewhat founded. But, but the reality is, in, in much of the church, not all, but much. There is a lot there. There's just a lot there um, in terms of property and, and, as, and assets, a lot more than we maybe imagine initially. 
Yeah. So another theme that I, I maybe I read into, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, that I picked up through throughout the book um, is a question, I guess, of ecclesiology, to use a big word. And so the question comes out in this, like, do we need to redefine what we mean by church? Because you just kind of alluded to to it prior in your answer about kind of church doesn't just have to be about Sunday morning. Um, so I, I guess maybe this is a two-part question. Like, do we need to redefine church? Or, well, what is church? Uh, and do we need to redefine it if, if it's not what we commonly think it is? Yeah, I mean, this is a, another, you know, one of these huge questions you can spend <laughs> your life uh, talking about. But and it, it is one that this that the pandemic has actually brought to, I think, a real yeah, head. Um, yeah. What is church when we don't even actually go to the building um, mm-hmm. for a year? Uh, what is church when um, worship happens over Zoom or Facebook Live and not in a sanctuary? Um just some of these questions are, you know, really have been raised in a powerful way, actually, as a result of the pandemic. And it is my hope that we will not miss that opportunity to think differently um, with what we've learned through through this through this time that's been such a difficult time. But uh, yeah, I guess I would say I do think that that mi- mission and ministry, at least, um, are certainly not limited to Sunday morning. Um, mm-hmm. and let me give you an example from, from Press House. So we do worship every Sunday at Press House. Um, and prior to COVID, we did a full worship service in a chapel um, with communion every mm-hmm. week, uh, preaching and songs and all that. It's of course, looks different during, during COVID. But, um, yeah. but we do a Sunday worship service with students. It's, it's vital. It's a big part of our, of our ministry. But it's just, a, a, you know, a, a couple hours on a Sunday um, we have 240 students that live in our apartment building their entire week, uh, day, day and night, um, other than when they're out at class. Um, and that we have an opportunity to serve them in a vastly different way than we do with people that come on a, on a Sunday for a, for a service. Yeah. Um, an example is a, we have a program for residents um, who are experiencing um, recovery from addiction, um, mm-hmm. heroin addiction or alcohol addiction or other drug addiction. And that program has dramatically transformed the lives of the students that are in that program. It yeah. has kept students in school that otherwise would not have made it through school. It has saved the state of Wisconsin more than a half million dollars in relapse related costs. Um, it is a truly transformative program and it has nothing to do with Sunday morning um, or in our case, Sunday evening worship. Um, yeah. directly, right? But we view that as integral part of our mission and our ministry and and perhaps in a broader sense, church. I mean, w- what did Jesus do? Jesus healed people. Jesus fed people. Jesus um, met with people uh, where they were at and brought good news to their life. If they were blind, if they were hungry, if they were sick, if they were addicts, if they were whatnot, that's that's church, I think that is, that is ministry. And so there's a way in which uh, some of the things that the church can do, and, and then sometimes through social enterprise, like a housing facility or something else, mm-hmm. can be really dramatically transformative um, for the lives of the people touched and the community uh, that they live in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one question I'd have, um, it's ca- is I wonder, can it like what's the challenge? Maybe if that's the right word of like, is it possible to a like spread yourself thin or like kind of like, I don't I don't know if this is the right way of saying it, but kind of go beyond your scope scope of practice, if you will. Um, like I've heard it said this way, like you know you don't the church doesn't need to be all things all people. Like you can work with other nonprofits. Um, so how do you how do you recommend like churches balancing like knowing what their mission is and their role as a church, but all, and, and conversely, like not trying to do everything. Yeah, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Um, there are many things that other people do better (laughs) than the church could or Mm -hmm. would do. Um, 
and uh, there's no no need to reinvent all of that if someone else can do it better. What I will say is that I think church communities, there are certain things church communities do very, very well. Um, and they're transferable skills, you might say, transferable um, value added gifts to a community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and it, it depends somewhat on who is in the church, who is in a particular yeah. congregation. Um, um, the Rooted Good, the other organization I, I, I work with um, and I'm helping to found, we offer a uh, an accelerator course for congregations to, uh, to to figure out what to do with their their buildings and and their property oh, called okay. the Oikos Accelerator, um, and uh, churches are invited to participate in that. And one of the things that we do is try to match, help them understand what their needs are in the community, and then match that with what their gifts are within their mm-hmm. congregation, both as individual members as well as the larger congregation. Congregations often have a culture or a a yep. thing that they're known for, a thing that they're good at. And many times that can be aligned with what the needs are in a community and they can offer them in new, different ways. Um, another example at Press House, we, we recently launched a wellness initiative we call Candid uh, for students mm-hmm. on campus. Um, we were hearing uh, increasingly students were in desperate need of mental health and wellness support. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's just, that's a proven documented, researched reality. We explored for a while doing a Christian counseling center or some sort of interfaith counseling center or some um, other one-on-one sort of services. And we determined that is actually an example of what you described, not in our wheelhouse, really. Um, Now we could have partnered, we could maybe have hired for that. But what we found was that what we're good at is community. And what students really wanted from us was a place to come in small groups to talk together about the therapy that they may be getting somewhere else or about the wellness issues that they were dealing with. So rather than hire a therapist to do therapy one-on-one, what they really needed from us was our gift and skill, which was bringing people together in community. And so for us, wellness and community is what we offer through Candid, as opposed to sort of personal, just one-on-one wellness. They're all related, of course, but that's our niche. That's what we can offer. And we can take what churches are really good at and then move into a space that churches aren't even showing up in necessarily, at least not in our campus. And so we now offer a candid circles for for Mm -hmm. students to be in um, wellness groups together, basically, in a way that is just not happened in any other way. And we can use there for our skill and our gift and marry it to the needs around us um, and contribute something really meaningful. That's awesome. Um, it leads me to a, a more finer question because um, throughout the book and kind of in your, in these conversations, you talk about um, leveraging property and selling property and stuff like that for, for ministry. And this is, this is kind of a selfish question. So I'll just frame it as a church planter who's invested in new churches <laughs> I wonder, is, in, from my perspective, again, this is coming from me as a church planner, I get annoyed when church buildings get sold and the money goes to nonprofits because I think, like, nonprofits have broader uh, avenues to receive revenue than churches traditionally have, at least in, in today's context. So, I guess, A, am I misunderstanding it uh, that that take and be like, tell me if I'm wrong, I guess. I mean, I think the fundamental question is in any church property is what is it, what can it be used for that really furthers the mission of that church or of the sort of church at large. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and the answer to that question is not simple. It, it could be a whole slew of things. It could be selling it in order to generate some revenue for some other use. Um, It could be offering up up to a different community to use. Um, Mm -hmm. It could be launching a church plant within a building that is being returned around into, you know, it could be it's offering it to a different denomination. It could be offering it to a Muslim community to, to have a, to have a a place to worship in where, where they don't in, in town. You know, there's lots of ways in which it could be used. It could be, of course, used for some sort of social enterprise. Um, mm-hmm. It could be redeveloped as a co-working space. It could be turned into a grocery co-op. It could be 
uh, it could become housing, it could become senior housing, student housing, affordable housing. Um, the, the, the options are sort of endless. The, the, the question is how do you align the aims of, of, of the property or the, or the use, possible uses of the property with the core mission of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I wouldn't say it's one or the other. I think it could be both. And, and, mm -hmm. and it could be it could be that its best use is to turn it over to a nonprofit or to sell it and use pass on the funds to a nonprofit. But I also could be that a partnership could be developed and that the church itself could be a part of that. Or um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I guess the options are quite numerous. And I think your caution, I guess, about just selling things, I think, is a valid one. One of my concerns mm -hmm. is in the next decade we're going to see the, a massive sale of churches, uh, church yeah. buildings. Or at least yeah. a massive repurposing of church buildings, and I yeah. worry that they will end up um, either simply being sold off because we just don't know what to do with them to the highest bidder, um, or mm -hmm. redeveloped for the most money. Um, neither of which yeah. is necessarily a particularly faithful or fruitful uh, use of of property that, in many cases, has existed for decades and upon decades. Um, yeah. You know, in prime yeah, location. I mean, that's yeah. yeah, I'd say that's definitely like my, I can't think today, but, you know, as a church planner, that's like, that's where my aim, where I center around is like, I want, I'm biased, like I want more resources to go to new churches, but all you say is great, and it kind of speaks to you, like, just don't, just don't be like haphazard with resources, Absolutely. like, think about what you're doing, and like, if I'm hearing you right, it's like even if you're gonna sell a building and, and donate for a nonprofit, like make sure it's extending the ministry of that church in some way, right? Yes, absolutely. You know, we what we we at Press House um, are a really interesting case because around the, the late 1990s, um, uh, three three campus ministries were under question: the University of Wisconsin Madison Presbyterian campus ministries, mm -hmm. so in Madison, at Iowa. University of Iowa and at the University of Minnesota. Okay. University of Minnesota and at the University of Iowa, those properties were sold, oh. and uh, and the the pro the funds the proceeds were put into a, a fund to fund campus ministry sort of broadly. Um, in Wisconsin in Madison, the local Presbyterians said, "No way, we're not going to let you mm -hmm. sell this." There were a lot of active alumni in the area still, and there was a huge internal church fight <laughs> over <laughs> our property. And uh, fortunately, those that said no way won, um, and we ended up holding on to it, which allowed us to do the redevelopment. Otherwise, we yeah. wouldn't even be talking, you and I, and I would have, this book would never been written. I would never have done any of this stuff uh, at Press House if that property had been sold. What's interesting is today, there's no campus, no really vibrant Presbyterian campus ministry at either of those campuses, um, and no properties there. And the mm -hmm. money's mostly mostly gone from those funds, yeah. and uh, and now in Madison we're serving, you know, over eight hundred students a year, thousands of students over, you know, five year period. Um, our property's worth twenty five million dollars probably, and we generate two and a half million dollars of revenue every year. The, the the disparity in outcome couldn't be more stark between what happened in those in those different settings. Again, I'm not saying that you always don't sell or you just never sell. That's not realistic. That's not necessary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the you know the the difference in what happened as a result of what we did with the property in Madison versus what happened in those other settings is just enormously stark. And I'll say this, Mark, from my perspective, uh, it seems like too many churches see like selling their building as like their as like their I don't know. Words not Hail Mary because they see it as like they see it as this automatic revitalization tool. They're like, hey, we're gonna sell our building, we're gonna have all this money, we're gonna like revitalize our ministry. And I mean, I'm sure there's examples of it happening where it works out, but I, I was also reminded, um, I think it was like a year or two ago, somebody called me who I knew uh who was a pastor here in Colorado and, and moved to like the northeast and his church had sold their building. And like they'd been meeting in a school for like three months and they called me is like, Hey, we're looking for a building again. <laughs> Interesting. Right. And once you sell it, you're never getting it back. I mean, that's the yeah. other thing. 
Um, uh, and for listeners who want to know anything about mobile church, I can tell you all the horror stories. So just call me or email me later after this is listened to. <laughs> another another um, version of this question is a, an example too here in Madison, where we we had a we had a church that we sold our presbytery um, a number of years ago in a pretty good location in Madison. The church's time was done, and that's fine, and it was celebrated, mm-hmm. and that that's part of life is also death, yep. and 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 there's nothing wrong with that at all, and it's, it was a was good to have it have its time in that past and we sold the, the building um uh, to a muslim community actually which was also great and wonderful and mm-hmm. they had a now a, a place to worship um but what we didn't do was do anything intentional with the funds um and mm-hmm. so the money it was about a million dollars um total uh was all broken up into small grants and distributed out around the town um mm-hmm. I can't complain too much. As a, a, a press house, we received some of that money as sort of a mission partner, and we put it yeah. to good use. We There's no question we put it to good use, and I'm sure all of the other partners who received money put it to good use. However, it's all gone. Um, yeah. And had we kept that million dollars and created a, a, a revolving loan fund, for example, um, we could have used that as seed money to launch affordable housing projects perhaps build a housing project on the property of another church in town, which has extra land, using mm-hmm. funds from the closed church. And then yeah. it becomes a recycled, growing um, pool of money to continue to do things with that. Um, well, Mark, and- you're setting me up here. Uh, <laughs> you're like setting me up for this like uh, T-ball question that I have to ask you now. Uh so, like, I'm going to set you up now since you set me up. So, you're talking about impact investing, which you talk about in your book. Uh, and I think the first thing to say is, like, money gets spent. Like, that was one of my one of my good friends. Uh, I remember I got my first ministry job, and I was like, oh, my goodness, look how much money I'm making. And she's like, you'll spend it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but talk about impact investing and how, um, like, talk about, I mean, you, you're kind of explaining already in your answer uh, there, but talk more about impact investing and how denominations should look more into that. Yeah, so I, I think I alluded to this at the beginning of our of our conversation. Most uh, church entities invest pretty traditionally. They, they put um, their invested assets, saved assets, into um, the stock market, basically, and, and bond funds. Um, you know, the, the biggest holdings of most of our denominational investments would be Apple and Amazon and Google, mm-hmm. Alphabet, Google's parent, Facebook. Um, often we've screened out uh, sort of sin stocks, they might be called, like tobacco yep. and things, weapons sometimes. Um, there's some movement to screen out um, energy, uh, you know, fuel, yeah. uh, gasoline, thing, those sorts of things, um, oil companies. But by and large, we still put it in just the regular market. And the point generally is to try to generate as much money as possible, get the highest return mm-hmm. you can get, and then to turn around and use that money um, for mission. Um, it, uh, some people have called that a two-pocket way of thinking. And out of one pocket, mm-hmm. you, you, you invest and make money, and then out of the other pocket, you give money away. That model is okay to some extent, except that there are ways in which um, the actual invested capital funds, the, uh, the original funds can be used more strategically. So if in mm-hmm. that scenario, what's happening is you might put in uh, you know, a, a pot of, of a million dollars into an investment, and then you're only actually generating a small portion of return off of that every year that you're using mm-hmm. for mission. The rest of the million dollars is sitting there um, being used by Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and all of these companies. <laughs> They're using that money, yep. your money, every second yep. of every day to grow their business, to make the next Alexa device, to you know create the newest uh, thumbs up, you know like button on Facebook. That's what they're using yeah. that money for. Yeah. Um, and in exchange for that, they're paying you something back. There, there are places that we could use that money differently um, right into the lives and the, and the communities that we're trying to care about. So um, 
you know, at Press House, we took an investment and we use that to offer student, unique student housing um, to students at the University of Wisconsin. And instead of that money being used by these companies, it's being used by a mission-oriented organization. That's what impact investing is essentially, is using um, investment capital for direct impact, positive direct impact. And it can be everything from a simple direct small project sort of like ours to um, investing in a fund that does microfinance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it could be investing in clean energy or some other sort of thing where you want to move the needle, so to speak. Um, one of the ideas that I'd really love to see is, uh, is to, to see church entities take some of their assets and create, um, funds that would invest in black owned, um, businesses, um, yeah. or black led nonprofits. Um, I mean, the truth of the matter is a lot of our investment assets have ties to slavery and have ties to, yeah. um, land that was taken from indigenous, um, yeah. native uh, first uh, native people. And, uh, and we don't recognize that very well. And um, one of the ways we could offer restitution uh, for that is to actually take some of the money and put it to work um, uh, in, uh, in entrepreneurs of color or, you know, in projects um, like that, rather than just giving it to Mark Zuckerberg or, uh, or Google uh, to, to use. So that, that's yeah. the idea of impact investing. Yeah, those are great points. Um, talk about uh, the kind of last question I want to ha ask you before we take a break here is like, I know a pastor, I know a church in my town that would be like a freaking perfect model for your kind of like pop property development as a way of doing ministry and also as like a, a revenue stream. I think the pastor has thought about it. You know, I've heard him talk to me about it. What's your advice to like an ambitious pastor who's like, boy, I really would like to kind of go down this road, but I'm not, you know, I don't have financial real estate experience. You know, my board is like super, I mean, I, obviously the board's going to be somewhat behind it, but what's your advice to like a general, you know, to that pastor? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Have you invited him to do an MBA with you? Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I guess to some extent, I would say, look for opportunities to learn outside of the traditional settings um, that we are trained in. I mean, I, I, I was trained traditionally uh, at seminary and um, many wonderful things about that experience, but many things were, were also missing from it. Um, learn about entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a lot of people that know a lot about it, actually. Um, uh, an MBA is not a bad idea, but it doesn't necessarily require doing a whole degree either to, to learn some of this stuff. Um, yeah. I spent my in my early years, uh, uh, I spent most of my continuing education time and money on um, nonprofit leadership courses and, uh, um, yeah. you know, fundraising courses, uh, business management courses, financial planning courses, those sorts of things, because those were things I needed to add to my my skill deck um, that I didn't have coming out of seminary. Um you know, one of the things we struggle with in the church is we, we often like to recreate the same thing that somebody else is doing, but do it worse. Yep. <laughs> we don't need to. We, we yeah. don't need to. There's some really good stuff out there. Um, the other thing, I'll do a plug for, you know, for my organization, Rooted Good. This is what we do. We provide yeah. resources and tools specifically for our entrepreneurs. And uh, many of them um, are used by faith-based entrepreneurs uh, and churches. Um, we have an accelerator course called Make Good, um, and it teaches you how to create new things. Um, oh. And that's exactly what it's for. And uh, and so there, there are some excellent resources out there um, to, 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 tr to get trained on. And then the other truth of the matter is for all entrepreneurs anywhere, you just got to try stuff. Yeah. And it's not all going to work. Some of it's not going to work. If it's all working, you're not really trying anything, frankly. Because What a great point. You know, so yeah. th just give it a shot. Try something simple. Start with a small business idea and um, and give it a go and see what you, you learn. And you learn more by doing that than in any any degree program or course, uh, just by trying something. I mean, don't say that because I'm halfway through my MBA, but <laughs> <laughs> you're probably right. I have to give a shout out to you here, Mark, to my own denomination. Uh, Disciples of Christ have a national benevolent association that they 
this is how I met Mark was the uh, they have a social I'm blanking on what it's called right now they have a social entrepreneurship program so check it out if you'd like to learn more about them um, let's take a break Mark and we'll come back with some closing questions Are you a worship leader who is going through a faith shift while still trying to produce 52 services a year? Are you a lead pastor who is dealing with high turnover on your creative team? Torn Curtain Arts exists to strengthen the creative soul of the local church by providing coaching, creative consulting, and interim worship leaders from our team with 20 years experience in the trenches of ministry. We help leaders get off the ministry treadmill of chasing Sunday after Sunday. Learn more about how we can help you and your team by visiting torncurtainarts.org. All right, we're back with Reverend Mark Elsden. And Mark, I always tell folks you can take these closing questions as seriously or not as you like. Uh, So if you're Pope for a day, what do you want to do? What's that day look like? Yeah, I think uh, I, I said this earlier, um, but I would I would say it again. If I, if I, with regard to this topic, if I were Pope for the day, so to speak, I I'd love to see um, Christian uh, denominations immediately take ten percent of that four hundred billion dollars of invested assets and set it aside as a below market rate investment fund for black uh, owned or black led uh, social businesses and nonprofits. I think it would be yeah. um, a, a powerful act of reparation. I think it would be a really impactful um, move. I mean, you're, that would be huge sums of money uh, that that would that would flow into very different sectors, um, and in doing so, really focus on on how to shift ownership and wealth um, from historically um, white uh, institutions uh, to to a much more diverse set of people. Um, that would it just be incredible to see what could happen if that if that was done. Um, even just ten percent would yeah. be a fantastic move. Yeah, yeah. Um, a theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life. So the honest answer to this question is nobody. I I don't I I'm not really interested actually in going back uh, to. <laughs> The, the people that have gone before us have done incredible, wonderful things. All of, you know, so many of them, not all of them, so many of them. Um, but I don't really feel the need to bring any of them back. I, I all think right. we want to look Fair forward enough. and look ahead. Yeah. Uh, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Well, this is a, I mean, this is a much, a, another huge question, but I think this yeah. moment that we've lived in, in the last, um, year, uh, um, one of the things that, that comes to mind is is this question of uh, of white nationalism that has sort of become, um, mm-hmm. I don't know how exactly embedded in the Christian American Christian uh, faith in such a way that it I think jeopardizes its entire witness and existence um, yeah. as a as a Christian uh, faith. So, you know, <laughs> how are we going to get through that? What is what are we going to do to move past that? Um, uh, to to reclaim uh, the message of Jesus and not of uh, of something that's totally unrecognizable um, a, a, as a Christian as a Christian faith. Yeah. Um, this year has 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 been very difficult in that regard. So I'm hopeful that we can we can move beyond that. Well, here's your question, Mark. Uh, what do you hope for the future of Christianity? I think. Um, I am hopeful that in many ways, as the church struggles, much of the church struggles with its relevancy, with its um, economics, um, with, with, with all of that, that, that it actually opens up more possibility for things to be done differently. Mm. Um, sometimes you have to basically have, uh, you know, nowhere else to go um, yeah. <laughs> before people are willing to do things differently and change. I do think that there is a really inspiring movement among young people in particular to um, live lives that are integrated, to be mm-hmm. um, really have a, have a powerful connection between what they do, what they say, what they 
believe, what they um, think and how they live. So kind of returning all the way to the beginning of our conversation around what it means mm-hmm. to, to live out the faith. I think there's an opportunity for that to happen in new and creative ways. I think it'd be great to see church um, be uh, recovery communities and um, uh, grocery co-ops and, uh, and, and things that matter to people in their neighborhood um, in addition to, to worship, for sure, mm-hmm. but that, that, that w- we can be the church in the midst of, of the communities uh, that we're in in a way that is truly impactful and meaningful um, and meeting needs. Uh, I think there's, there's enormous hope for that. Awesome. Uh, as they say, what, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So, yeah. Well, right. Uh, tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and get the book. So probably the best place is at my website, um, mlston.com, M-E-L-S-D-O-N.com. And the uh, book is there, and there's a page of links to a lot of the other resources, actually, that we talked about today, um, and, uh, and ways to reach me. So love to hear from folks. Yeah, check it out. Uh, Mark, thanks for your time, and uh, may God's peace be with you. Thank you. Good to talk. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. But hey, before you go, do us a favor, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people. Thanks, and go in peace.